Um, our next speaker hardly needs uh, an introduction. He is an award-winning uh, science journalist and author, former fellow of the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University, and founder of the highly influential e-magazine, Mad in America. He is author of five books, including the highly acclaimed Mad in America and Anatomy of an Epidemic. His articles in psychiatry and the pharmaceutical industry have garnered many national awards, including the George Polk Award for Medical Writing and the National Association of Science Writers Award. Finally, he was finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for a series he co-wrote for the Boston Globe on the abuse of mental patients in research settings. In short, these accolades and many others besides mark our next speaker as one of the most important and influential critics of psychiatry alive today. Please join me in warmly welcoming uh, Robert Whittaker. Uh, well, first of all, I have to say it's both a great honor to be here and a bit humbling. Um, if you really want to look where the best critical examination of the modern biological story has come from, it's come from Great Britain. Uh, there's many people here. The, the Critical Psychiatry Network has been a leader in deconstructing the story. I went to school on so many of the people here. Uh, I, so you're lucky here. And you're also with the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, what James are doing and Luke are doing, they're bringing it out to the public in a way that I don't know is happening anywhere else. So it is humbling to be here, and I'm very grateful to be here, so thank you. What I hope to do in the next uh, 45 minutes, and I think I can do one thing here, is, uh, by the way, that was a brilliant deconstruction of the DSM, I have to say. Such, <laughs> it, it, it shows the ludicrous nature of it. I mean, it's just really well done. It was really brilliant. What I hope to do in the next 45 minutes is uh, look a bit about the story around the narrative around psychiatric drugs, what is the common narrative, and then really give you a counter narrative, and hopefully in this 45 minutes even get a bit of a sense of how we can think about this question of whether psychiatric drugs do more harm than good or not, and look what science, how can we review the scientific literature to gain some insight into that question. So what's the common wisdom? Uh, this is a, a quote from Edward Shorter, who is a well-known historian of psychiatry from the University of Toronto. And what he says is that in 1950s, a new drug came into asylum medicine. The, the chemical name is chlorpromazine. I think it was known as Lordactyl here in Europe. And he says, this drug arrives, and it initiates a revolution comparable to the introduction of penicillin in general medicine. Now, there have been few things as important in the advance of medicine in the 20th century as the introduction of penicillin into general medicine. In fact, some people think that helped us win, the Allies win World War II. And of course, uh, what does penicillin do? It, it cures uh, bacterial infections very quickly. So he's saying this is the equivalent great leap forward. Now, if you go to this story of progress, and this is the general narrative that drives our, our understanding of psychiatric drugs, it goes like this. This is remembered as, uh, chlorpromazine is remembered today as the first antipsychotic. Can you hear the word antipsychotic? As if it's a special antidote. It's a specific antidote to psychosis. It's not a tranquilizer. It's an antidote to some biological problem. And then we get antidepressants. We get anti-anxiety agents. This is the start of this psychopharmacological revolution that is remembered. We're told this is what made it possible to empty the mental hospitals and for seriously uh, mentally ill people to live in the community, live fairly normal lives. That's what Shorter says in his book. And then if you, get, if you go forward with the story of progress, we begin to learn in the 1980s that these drugs fix chemical imbalances in the brain. We've all heard this, right? Like insulin for diabetes. Now, if that story is true, it tells of an extraordinary scientific discovery. Think about how complex the brain is, and what we're being told is that psychosis or schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine in the brain. Depression is due to too little serotonin. If that's so, that's an extraordinary discovery. And then we're told that these drugs fix those uh, problems. Think about that. That is a tale of astonishing scientific 
progress. Then beginning with the arrival of Pen uh, Prozac, and I do believe you call it Prozac here as well, right? The first SSRI, which arrives on the market in 1988. That's the first of the second generation drugs said to be safer than, and more effective than the first. So we get SSRI antidepressants. They're better than the tricyclics. We get a new generation of antipsychotics, so-called atypical antipsychotics, said to be better than the first. You see this story up, this letter of medical progress. It fits into that larger narrative. And in 1998, our US Surgeon General, David Satcher, he wrote a 400-page report on mental health. And here's what he says. Prior to 1955 and the arrival of chlorpromazine, we lacked treatments that would prevent people from becoming seriously, uh, chronically ill. Now we have a vast array of safe and effective treatments that prevent this chronicity for well-defined disorders. And so that becomes codified in this narrative of progress. And really, this narrative has indeed changed our societies. And in terms of use of psychiatric medications, now in the United States, one in five people takes a psychiatric drug every day. And our, it's a little hard to get the children usage, but it's at least 10% every day. And by the time our children are 18, it's, it's 15 to 20% who are now taking a drug every day. An extraordinary commercial success, of course. In 1987, we in the United States spent about $800 million on psychiatric drugs. We now spend about $40 billion, a 50-fold increase. So it's a story of medical progress, and it's also a, clearly a commercial success. Now, what I'm going to try to do is put that narrative of progress under a, psycho, uh, uh, a scientific microscope, in essence. The first thing is, when you get an effective medical treatment for a disorder, that disorder, hopefully, or that disease, the burden of that disease will go down in society. So just let's go back to antibiotics. People stop dying from bacterial infections, right? So one of the first things I did is, well, let's just look at the number of people as this revolution unfolded who can no longer work, who can no longer care for themselves and need government care because they're disabled by a mental illness. Now, in 1955, we had no uh, social security system for caring for people in the community. So, quote, the disabled mentally ill were in mental hospitals. You look at the number of people in mental hospitals in 1955 in the US with a psychiatric diagnosis, it's about 350,000, and that's a disability rate of about 200 per 100,000 population. Now, 1987, by this time, deinstitutionalization is fairly complete. We're caring for people in the community, and we have set up a system of, of disability pensions for people who are disabled by mental illness. And you'll see by 1987, there was 1.25 million people on disability in the United States because of a mental illness. Now, what people might say is this is an apples to oranges comparison. It's not fair. You had to be more severely ill to be in the hospital in 1987, in 1955, to be on disability in 1987. But now we have an oranges to oranges comparison, just the number of people receiving a disability payment in the US because of mental illness. And what has it happened during the second generation of psychiatric drugs? It's quadrupled. And in total numbers, we're now up to about 5 million. But by this per capita rate, it's tripled. Now, this doesn't prove anything, but it starts to raise a question about this paradigm of care. Why is the burden rising? Now, after anatomy came out and I presented this data, people said, ah, oh, that's because it's in the United States. You don't have national health service. <coughs> people are going on disability in order to get access to health care. So now I've had a chance to look at other countries. This is just in the Prozac era. How about New Zealand? A quadrupling of people on disability in the past 20 years. How about Australia? Quadrupling in the past 20 years. This is a little bit different data. It's the number of people going on disability each year. What's interesting about this data, Iceland is a small country. When the pharmaceutical companies really began marketing antidepressants, it's in the middle 90s. And all of a sudden, you see this rise in the number of people going on antidepressants. By the way, the disability numbers are not being driven by psychotic disorders. It's being driven by affective disorders, depression, and in the United States, at least, by bipolar. And in, I don't have the Britain data. Joanne Moncrief has done some of this work. You're seeing a big rise in the number of days lost to disability due to depression in Britain as well. Here's new cases of disability in Denmark. You'll see that the number of new cases has tripled in the last 12 years. This is Sweden. What this data is, the percentage of disability cases each year, new ones, 
Uh, you can see in 1992, uh, mental illnesses were about 16% of new cases. Now it's 60%. The point is you see this rising burden of mental illness, of disabled people unable to work in country after country that has adopted this paradigm of care. Now, I don't think this proves anything, but it does raise a question, why is this happening as we use these medications more and more? Why is the burden, at least by disability numbers, going up? Now, the second thing I think we need to do in terms of that narrative of progress, we do have to look at the chemical imbalance story. Did they find this to be true? And what did we, in fact, learn about how the medications act on the brain? This is the second part of that narrative of progress. So here's how the chemical imbalance theory arose. It did not arise from an understanding of what was going on in the brains of people diagnosed with schizophrenia or psychotic disorders or depression. It arose from an understanding of how these new drugs acted on the brain. So for example, they came to understand that antipsychotics blocked dopamine receptors. In other words, they diminished or thwarted the passage of uh, messages along dopaminergic uh, pathways. So they said if we're lowering dopamine in these people, maybe schizophrenia is due to too much dopamine. It's a hypothesis. And the same thing with the antidepressants, the first generation of monoamine oxidase inhibitors and tricyclics. They came to understand they kept serotonin, these uh, monoamines longer in the synaptic cleft, that space between neurons. So they're upping that activity. So they hypothesized maybe the problem is low monoamine activity. So the hypothesis arises from understanding the mechanism of action of the drugs. Now they have to investigate this in the 70s and all. They have to see, do people with depression, for example, do they have low serotonin before they go on the drug? Now the NIMH, which is our premier agency for investigating mental health disorders, begins to do a study in the late 70s, early 80s. And what I'm just going to give you the conclusions here. 1984. Elevations or decrements in the functioning of serotonergic systems per se are not likely to be associated with depression. You can read the next one. Who's Stephen? And so this theory actually begins falling apart the mini minute they begin investigating it. Prozac is brought to market in 88. It's, high, it's really marketed as a, as a drug that fixes the serotonergic system. There's a lot more investigations into the serotonergic system. And what do they find? They just don't find it. Who's Steven Stahl? He's a pretty famous, uh, he believes in biological psychiatry. This is not a critic. He wrote a textbook in 2000. What does he say after 20 years of this investigation of the theory? There is no clear and convincing evidence that monoamine, serotonin is a monoamine, deficiency accounts for depression. That is, there is no real deficit. Go forward. The schizophrenia story is a bit more complicated. There's still some people uh, looking to see if there's some problems, transitory problems with the dopaminergic system. But they look to see, is overactivity a, a characteristic thing to be found in people before, is there a lesion in that system before they go on drugs? Who is Stephen Hyman? He's a former director of the NIMH. He's a neuroscientist at Harvard. What does he write in 2002? There is no compelling evidence that a lesion in the dopamine system is a primary cause of schizophrenia. Next, Kenneth Kendler. He's a big researcher in this whole chemical imbalance theory. And in 2005, he summed up this long history. And what does he say? We have hunted for big, simple neurochemical explanations for psychiatric disorders, and we have not found them. And this is my favorite quote now. Now what is happening, at least among American psychiatry, since this chemical imbalance theory has collapsed, we have many psychiatrists saying, we never said that. <laughs> the, he's the editor-in-chief, former editor-in-chief of Psychiatric Times, and you'll see what he says. In truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend, never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists. You can still go on websites today run by the American Psychiatric Association or patient advocacy groups where they have scientific advisory boards where you can read that antidepressants fix a known chemical imbalance in the brain. Uh, a small story. I was giving a grand rounds at Massachusetts General Hospital, which is has the, it's associated with Harvard, leading psychiatric department in the country. So I was giving a talk, and then they had someone to respond, and the person says, you know, you made us look bad in your book by pretending that we told about that we believed in chemical imbalances. 
And the guy says, we've known that's been outdated. That's an outdated theory. For 25 years, we gave that up. So I said to him, you know what? You're right. It did fall apart scientifically 25 years ago, but I'm pretty sure you failed to communicate that to the American public. Because <laughs> if you asked a group of people who've been diagnosed in the United States, how many of you were told you had a chemical imbalance? Every, every hand in the room goes up. And something like 87% of Americans now know that low serotonin causes depression. So now we have to ask, if they're not fixing a chemical imbalance, what happens to the brain when you go on the drug? And you can read a paper by uh, uh, Stephen Hyman, written in 1996, and he says this. These drugs perturb normal systems. Now, the brain being a very neuroplastic organ, in response to that perturbation, is going to try to compensate for this perturbation. And in this compensation, it's trying to maintain normal functioning. What the researchers will say, it's trying to maintain a homeostatic equilibrium. And look what he concludes. The chronic administration of these drugs cause substantial and long-lasting alterations in neural function. After a few weeks, the person's brain is now functioning in a manner that is, quote, qualitatively as well as quantitatively different from the normal state. So we have over here in the conventional narrative a story of drugs that fix an abnormality. We go in the scientific literature, and what we found is no known pathology. But then that doesn't mean there may not be a pathology in some people, but we don't know what it is. And we find that the drugs actually create abnormalities. And here's just a quick uh, look at how this is done. So how do neurons communicate in the brain? You have a presynaptic neuron that releases a neurotransmitter, a molecule like serotonin or dopamine, into the tiny gap between neurons, which we called the synaptic cleft. Then that molecule binds with receptors on the receiving neuron, which we call the postsynaptic neuron. We say that molecule fits into those receptors like a key into the lock. Have you heard all that metaphor? OK, so what does an antipsychotic do? An antipsychotic gums up all these uh, receptors. So now the molecule can't bind with those receptors, a particular type of receptor called the D2. You're thwarting it. So what does the brain do when you go on an antipsychotic? It increases. It tries to become extra sensitive to dopamine. And you can see why. The drug is acting as a brake. So what does your brain do? It tries to put down the accelerator. Okay, You can see why. And that's going to be a sort of a universal understanding of drugs. You go on an antidepressant. It ups serotonergic activity. It's acting as an accelerator. What's your brain going to do? It's going to dial down its serotonergic uh, receptors. The presynaptic neurons are going to put out less serotonin for, uh, for a brief period of time. That compensatory adaptation may break down. But then the receiving neurons are actually going to decrease their density of serotonergic receptors. So here's the irony. Investigators did not find that chemical imbalances are known causes of mental disorders. But after you go on a drug, you actually end up physiologically with the very abnormality hypothesized to cause the problem in the first place. So for example, it was hypothesized that maybe the problem with schizophrenia was too many dopamine receptors. Prior to going on the drug, you don't have too many dopamine receptors. But after you do, <laughs> you end up with 50 to 100% more than normal. And same thing, depression was hypothesized to be due to low serotonin. Before you go on the drug, you don't have that physiologically. But after you do, after you go on the drug, you do. OK? Now, I'm just going to show you. Uh, this is sort of jumping ahead of the story. But as people have started to look at the chronic course of mental disorders, they're now going back to this idea. Maybe the problem is that the drugs induce a change over the long term, this oppositional tolerance, the opposite of what is originally intended. Okay, it's becoming sort of a universal concern. And this person, well-known mood disorders person who used to work for Eli Lilly, so this is not a critic, okay? Continued drug treatment may induce processes that are the opposite of what the medication originally produced. This may cause a worsening of the illness, continue for a period of time after discontinuing the medication, and may not be reversible. Now, one of the things that you've heard here, and uh, Luke has uh, spoken about, your story is public, so I think it's okay, is these protracted withdrawal symptoms. 
say from benzodiazepines. And this might be the mechanism for explaining it, is that your brain's not renormalizing, okay? Which tells you that going on a drug in the first place can be a profound thing to do. Oh, and I have to caution here. This is not meant to be a medical advice talk. It's just looking at, in a big picture, what is science telling us about? And it's a way for society to have an informed discussion. But it shouldn't be taken for advice for anybody on an individual level. OK, now the last thing I'll do here is we'll look at the evidence base for the use of antipsychotics short term and then long term. Why antipsychotics? Antipsychotics are at the heart of the story, the narrative of progress. These are the drugs that made it possible to empty the asylums. They're the best studied class of drugs. They're the, also the class of drugs that are seen as beyond um, doubt. We know these drugs help people long term. We know they're essential. At least in the United States, not only are you supposed to take them forever, to not give them forever is seen as bad medicine, negligent medicine. So if any class of drugs should have a clear uh, story in the scientific literature that they provide a long-term benefit, it should be this class of drugs. So as you can see, I'm a journalist. I'm not a, I'm not a, psych I'm not a medical expert. I'm not an academic, actually. I'm just a journalist. So what is my first, if I'm going to raise this question, how do medications affect people long term? What's my first responsibility? Is to find out what is the evidence base for this class of drugs. And it's three parts. One, people come into uh, emergency rooms. They did studies in the 50s and 60s. Half are put on drug. Half are put on placebo. The drug group has a greater diminishment of psychotic symptoms over six weeks than the placebo group. Now, as Peter may say, there are flaws with these studies, but I don't want to get into this right now. So that becomes the evidence for short-term use, OK? They diminish psychotic symptoms better than placebo over the short term. Now, imagine you're a doctor in the 50s and 60s. You have patients on these drugs. What's your next question? How long should I use them, right? I've got them on. Now, how long? So they ran studies designed like this. They took that subset of people who were good responders to the drugs, and it has to be a, the good responders, because you need people who are the symptoms under control. Half are going to be maintained on the drug. Half are going to be withdrawn abruptly from the drug. And with great regularity, this group that was withdrawn from the drug relapsed at a higher rate. So researchers said, see, you take away the drug, and the disease returns. Staying on the drug reduces the long-term risk of relapse. And that today is still cited as the evidence for maintaining people on drugs is the relapse studies. Now, the third bit of evidence, I think, actually is clinical experience. You're a doctor. A person comes into the emergency room. You give them the drug. Uh, the, the symptoms abate. You see it works, right? Then you discharge the, person, the, the patient. That patient says, I hate these drugs. I throw them away. And then they show up back at your uh, emergency room. So what do you see? you see that the person needs the drug. That's what you see, OK? In some ways, I think this is the most powerful bit of uh, evidence base. OK, next, is there anything missing from this evidence base of relapse studies? And what you find this, first of all, do the relapse studies tell you anything about how people are functioning long term? Are they socializing? Are they working? There's no functional element, right? What the relapse studies tell you is, don't go off your drugs abruptly. That's true. But they're not telling us how people are functioning long term. That's one. Second, you see the flaw in the, in the design of the studies, right? Abrupt withdrawal, we all know now that abrupt withdrawal increases the risk of relapse. It's a drug withdrawal effect. There's actually been very few studies where they tried to get people off successfully in gradual tapers. So a lot of what you're seeing there is, in fact, a drug withdrawal of reflect, uh, effect. How about the physician's experience? Do we know what is the natural long-term course of psychosis? We don't, right? The clinicians don't see it. So we don't really know what would happen is if you never expose someone to an antipsychotic and see what happens over two years, five years, 10 years. All we know is once you go on, your brain changes, and it's going to be difficult to come off. OK, now, is there some other type of evidence? And I hope you see I'm trying to show a, an approach to this, an intellectual pro approach to investigating this question. OK, we ad admit the relapse studies have flaws. Is, are there other types of evidence that people can point me to that says 
This shows us that antipsychotics are providing a long-term benefit. And here's what you find. Emmanuel Stipp, someone from the University of Montreal, did that in 2002, which was the 50th anniversary of the discovery of fluoropromazine. And he says this. This was really important to me. After 50 years of neuroleptics, are we able to answer the following simple question? Neuroleptics is another word for antipsychotics. Are neuroleptics effective in treating schizophrenia? There is no compelling evidence on the matter when long-term is considered. And then he wrote what to me was a green light for going on with this investigation, which I wrote about anatomy of an epidemic. If we wish to base psychiatry on evidence-based medicine, we run a genuine risk in taking a close look at what has long been considered fact. What he's saying is, we may be surprised by what we find. Okay? So what you're all going to do now in the next uh, 20 minutes is take that same risk, OK? So just in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of summarize what they find in the first 20 years. The first long-term trial done by the NIMH had four arms. Three groups were treated with drug in the hospital, one with placebo. At the end of six weeks, the drug-treated patients were doing um, better. Still a key trial cited. In fact, this is the, it's after this trial where people start calling these drugs antipsychotics instead of uh, major tranquilizers, OK? But many placebo patients get better. They're discharged. Now, what nobody cites is the one-year results. Because at the, at the end of one year, there was an oddity. The drug-treated patients had higher rehospitalization rates. So at this very beginning of the research literature, there's a hint of a paradox. Could drugs? that are effective over the short term? Could be they increasing the risk of relapse over the long term? Just a hint. Okay. Then we get a retrospective study done by Sanford Bachhoven at Boston Psychopathic Hospital. He has five-year data for people treated in 1947 with psychological therapies. This is before the arrival of the antipsychotics. He's going to compare them to a matched group of patients treated in, with psychological care in 67 and the drugs. And what does he find? He makes two findings. One, the relapse rate is higher in the modern group, and the functioning is much less. They're much more socially dependent. They're much less likely to be working. So he says, if we, worry, if we want to worry about long-term functioning, maybe we need to rethink this. Then there are, th because of this, there's one other thing. Clinicians, what are clinicians saying when these drugs are introduced? If you listen carefully, here's what they say. Boy, my patients are getting better faster, but boy, are they coming back to the hospital in droves. That was their clinical experience. And they even invented a term. You, you've heard the term revolving door syndrome? It comes from this time. And then they said this. We're also noticing that relapse on drug is more severe than on placebo. So this worry arises. The NIMH conducts three studies meant to revisit the, the, the value of these drugs over the long term in the 70s. And in each of these studies, you have people treated conventionally with drug and then in the experimental arm, either with no drug or a minimal use of drug, some sort of selective use of drug in psychological care. And in each of these three studies, the experimental arm did better. That's one. Two, you'd see a group that never needed to go on drug, and they would have the best outcomes. And three, overall, we had higher relapse rates in where people were regularly medicated, better social functioning over here. Okay? And at that point, and every person says, if you read, if we're interested in long-term clinical improvement, we may need to rethink this use of the drugs. But this is the key question. Now, this was raised by William Carpenter. He did one of the three studies at an NIMH hospital. And now, put yourself in the shoes of William Carpenter in the late 70s. You have data that shows if people are on meds, you take them away, they relapse. This is the first part. There's no question that once patients are placed on medication, they are less vulnerable to relapse if maintained on the drugs. That's the relapse studies. But what if these patients had never been treated with drugs to begin with? We raise the possibility that antipsychotic medication may make some patients more vulnerable to future relapse than would be the case in the normal course of the illness. You see why this takes your breath away? We're not talking about adverse effects here. We're worried that the drugs cause a change that make you more vulnerable to the very thing that drugs are supposed to treat, psychosis, OK? At this point, there's two people from uh, University of McGill University in Montreal who put together a biological explanation for this paradox. They say the drugs block dopamine receptors. Your brain responds by increasing its dopamine receptors, OK? 
Now, what happens when you go off drugs? You've got the accelerator down, right? And they say that predisposes you to severe relapse upon drug withdrawal. But they also said uh, this, the fact that you have this increase in dopamine receptors may eventually lead to a tardive or more chronic psychosis. Okay? And you'll see this. When this happens, the tendency towards psychotic relapse in a patient who has developed such a supersensitivity, and by the way, as far as I can tell, they all do. It's a natural response to the brain. It's determined by more than just the normal course of the illness. They then test their own thing, and they say, if we look at the end of 10 years, at least 30% of our patients are now chronically psychotic, and they're attributing it to the drug. And they say, when this happens, the illness appears worse than ever before. New symptoms of greater severity will appear. Now, there are stories of uh, Guy Chouinard and Barry Jones, the, the, the uh, Canadian investigators, telling this story to other psychiatrists. And psychiatrists in the audience going, are you kidding me? Are you telling me the very drug I use to treat psychosis is making people more biologically vulnerable to psychosis? You can see the cognitive dissonance, right? It's very hard to understand that. And now what happens? This, this worry arises in the 80s. 80s, and it gets put aside. Stop worrying about it. There's a famous, uh, there's, oh, what's his name? Solomon Snyder, I think it was, who says, okay, we've looked at this, it's not a worry. And he puts it, puts it aside from Johns Hopkins, okay? Gets buried. So now we're going to say this. Was it a really valid worry or not? That was the early 80s. We're in 2015. And let's review all the evidence we can of whatever type and see if Maybe it's a worry, or maybe it's not a worry, OK? Cross-cultural studies. The World Health Organization conducted two cross-cultural studies in the 70s and 80s. Uh, one was five years in length. The other was two years in length. They compared outcomes in what they called developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, with outcomes in the US and uh, six other rich countries. I do believe there was a Great Britain site in the study. Where was it at? It was, do you remember? It was one in Great Britain, anyway. And what they find? They found each time the outcomes were much better in the developing countries. By the way, this was the study that first attracted my attention to this whole subject. I wondered, why would living in a developed country, you'll see, be a strong predictor of not attaining a complete remission? Because I believed in the story of progress. And I'm wondering, well, why do you do better in rural India or rural Nigeria? Why do you do better? And you'll see exceptionally good social outcome. So after the first study, which was five years in length, and by the way, people are being diagnosed by Western doctors to standardize it, they hypothesized maybe the reason for the better outcomes in the poor countries is that they're more medication compliant. They take the drugs regularly. Now, that's a valid hypothesis. If you think the drugs are essential, then compliance should be associated with better outcomes. So they looked at medication usage, and what did they find? That in fact, in the poor countries, uh, they were not maintaining people regularly on the drugs. And in fact, in the two countries with the best outcomes, India and Nigeria, they basically weren't maintaining people at all on the drugs. They used them acutely, then they got them off. And that's where you saw the best outcomes. So at least in cross-cultural studies, we see better outcomes in countries that were using the drugs differently, acutely but not chronically. It's just one data point, all right? And you see when they came back 15 to your 20-year follow-up, so many of the patients where they weren't regularly medicated, were never psychotic anymore, and look at the employment rate, 73%. I will tell you there's a new cross-cultural study done by Eli Lilly, where the people in the poor countries, the developing countries, are kept on the drugs, and now their outcomes are as bad as ours in the developed world. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go real quickly, because I'm writing, uh, running behind on this. But there has been some animal model research. It was done by Philip Seaman. Philip Seaman was at University of Toronto, one of the people who discovered the mode of action on these drugs and discovered the fact that they elevate D2 receptors. And what he's developed is an animal model where you give like rats uh, lesions, or you give them uh, angel dust, hallucinogens, or you do certain lesions to the part of the brain. And he notices all these insults to the brain that he associates with psychotic-like behavior raise due to the levels, the density of do dopamine receptors, the D2 subtype. Every one, that's the final pathway. OK? OK, now he gives these rats Haldol or olanzapine, and what do these drugs do? The same thing. So he found that the drugs cause the very abnormality that the uh, lesions to the brain cause as well that are part of his model. Then he did this very quick experiment 
I love this experiment. He made his rat psychotic with one of these insults. He withdrew that. Well, then he put the drugs, uh, the people on drugs, antipsychotics. It reversed their psychotic behavior for a time. Now the insult is removed. He just keeps them on the drugs, and now the psychotic-like behavior returned in the animals. He calls this breakthrough uh, supersensitivity. These results are the first to demonstrate that breakthrough supersensitivity during ongoing treatment undermines treatment efficacy. So he's saying, at least in my animal models, the reason antipsychotics fail over time is they cause this increase in D2 receptors. <coughs> Next, uh, I'm going to go to this one. We now get MRI technology. We can now measure brain volumes. Nancy Andreasen is a very famous person in American uh, psychiatry. She was the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Psychiatry for a long time. She's a believer in the biological model. In the early 90s, she initiates this large MIR study of schizophrenia patients, and here's her theory. Schizophrenia is a, a, brain, a neurodegenerative disease characterized by brain volume loss over time. Okay? So she does this. She measures brain volumes over time, and she finds that's true. Their brains are shrinking. Okay? You'll see this. So she says, we've found the cause. And she's saying the problem is the drugs don't arrest this brain volume loss. <coughs> then if you really look closely, she says, as this brain volume loss happens, you get an increase in negative symptoms. That's the uh, apathy and all. Increased functional impairment after five years cognitive decline. But then the problem is, if you give these drugs to monkeys, you see the same thing. New drugs, old drugs, you see this brain volume loss. Uh, I, I presume the monkeys do not have schizophrenia. So it's uh, drug caused. So now she looks at this, and what does she say? Yes, this shrinkage is drug-related. Use of the old drugs, the new drugs, clozapine, all associated with smaller brain tissue value, uh, volumes. It's very of illness, substance abuse, had minimal or no effect. Here's what people are saying today. Maybe there is some brain shrinkage uh, loss that is uh, related to trauma, whatever you want to be. You may see some, in fact, at the baseline before you go on the drug. But at the very least, then, what drugs are doing is exacerbating that process. And that, so think about what you're seeing here. Drug comes in, causes a morphological change, and as that morphological change happens, you're getting worse negative symptoms and greater cognitive impairment. That's really a pretty clear uh, model of an iatrogenic uh, effect. You'll just see here, it causes the prefrontal cortex to slowly atrophy. This is Nancy Andreasen. So, you see the data points we're adding, cross-cultural studies, animal models. Now we have an MRI technology. There's more evidence on this. I'm just going fast. The Germans just reviewed this body of literature. So there's great evidence for this. Uh, and it says these brain volume loss seems to depend on cumulative dosage and can uh, exert adverse effects on neurocognition, negative and positive systems, and so psychosocial functioning. In other words, this brain volume loss is causing worse functioning, okay? This is the best prospective long-term study we have. It's done by Martin Harrow, a, a psychologist at the University of Illinois, along with a psychiatrist named um, Thomas Job. Here's its design. They enroll 200 psychotic patients, and you'll see most, many of them are first episode. They're young, so we're getting them early in the course of the disorder. And everybody's going to be treated in the hospital with drugs. Then they're going to be discharged, and he's just going to follow them at two, four and a half, seven, 10, 15, 20 years. At each follow-up, he's going to see, are they asymptomatic? How's their social functioning? And are they using meds? And the hypothesis is, those who take themselves off meds are going to do horribly. He expects to find them in jail, just psychotic. This is, in essence, meant to be a long-term study expected to show why you have to stay on the drugs. Now, by the way, at the end of 15 years, of the 200 patients he rolled, he still had 145 patients in his study. Any of you have done research, that is a very good inclusion rate at the end of 15 years. This is really an interesting uh, piece. At two years, um, <clears throat> he ends up with 64 schizophrenia patients at the end of 15, uh, 15 years and 81 with milder disorders. He also ends up with a group by end of two years is off meds, stays off meds all the time, and then there's another group of schizophrenia patients that is on meds and is compliant through the 20 years. And you will notice here, if I knew how to use this, but notice that when the, at two years, the people off medication are still psychotic. 
It's not that they got better on the drugs. They're not well. Okay, there's really no difference. Then look what happens between two and four and a half years. This is the only place in the research literature you see this longer healing process off meds. The relapse studies don't capture this, right? Relapse studies, you're on drugs, you come off, and you relapse. But you see this longer healing process? And look at the number of people who are psychotic at the end of 10, 15, 20 years. It's less than 10%. This is schizophrenia patients, by the way. This is not all of them. Now, how about if you stay on drugs? Does that show a, a drug that is taming the symptoms? It does not. People are staying psychotic. This is consistent with the idea that dopamine supersensitivity undermines the long-term efficacy. Just real quickly, anxiety symptoms, same thing. You see this healing that goes on off drugs. On drugs, you see sort of a tardive akathisia developing, constant anxiety, cognitive function, better off drugs. Recovery rates, to be in recovery, you had to be asymptomatic and working or in school at least 50% of the time. There's a functional component. You'll see um, there's this great leap in recovery between uh, year two and four and a half, such that 40% are in recovery off meds, only like six, seven, eight percent on meds. By 15 years, it's an eightfold higher recovery rate. This is the spectrum of outcomes. Off drug, 40% recovered, 44% so-so, 16% uniformly poor. You'll see on drugs, only 5% recovered, 46% so-so. It's as if outcomes have shifted along the spectrum. What did the researcher who's done the best long-term study conclude? You can read this. You can see that this is not a uh, conclusion that was widely publicized by the American Psychiatric Association or the pharmaceutical industry. Residents are not taught this information, OK? Uh, he also has milder disorders. Once again, it's the group off that does better. Now, please look at this. He ends up with four groups. Schizophrenia on meds, milder disorders on meds, schizophrenia off meds, uh, milder off. You see milder disorders on meds? They do worse than schizophrenia off. Now, schizophrenia have a worse prognosis, right? So how does schizophrenia off end up worse than milder on? You can see that one explanation is maybe the drugs are iatrogenic and they're worsening long-term outcomes. At the very least, this is a slide that needs to be examined. You can see that Martin Harrow, I got about two minutes left. Uh, Martin Harrow is saying, how unique is it that drugs that work over the short term become ineffective or harmful over the long term? He's now talking about this dopamine supersensitivity to explain why the drugs become harm harmful as the body readjusts biologically to the medications. I don't have time to go through this because I think it's two minutes or something. Uh, the complaint about Martin Harrow was it wasn't randomized, OK? It's naturalistic. Maybe there's some sort of natural selection. We get a randomized study out of the Netherlands, a seven-year study. People stabilized. Then they're randomized either to uh, tapering down to a low dose or off versus uh, drug care as usual. Now look at this. If you stop this study at two years, you will get data that says use the drugs because the relapse rate was higher in the drug tapered group. But they tried to manage people through that. There was actually very little uh, rehospitalizations. At the end of seven years, there's no difference in relapse rates. But look at recovery rates, more than twice as high for the tapered group. So now we have a randomized study supporting this idea. By the way, you can also, some of the people between year two and seven, it was a naturalistic study. If you'd been randomized to the drug continuation group, you could take yourself off. This is a grouping of people by the end who are off medication or on. You'll see greater symptom remission in those off, greater functional remission. Full recovery is, uh, what is that, about three times as high. His conclusions, antipsychotics may worsen functional outcomes, and we have been looking at the long, wrong things, folks. We've been looking at relapse studies, and that misleads us. We need a bit broader perspective, and we need to look at functionality. I'm going to skip. Well, real quickly, they did a, a medication compliance study in Australia. The idea was the problem is people go off these drugs. If we could have social services that uh, upped medication compliance, that should lead to better outcomes. So they did a study where people are put on drugs. They're stabilized. One group gets special care to up uh, medication compliance. The other gets care as usual. It works. The social service increases medication compliance. The problem was, you can read, 
Increase in medication adherence was associated with decreases in psychosocial functioning and increases in negative symptoms. So the program worked. The problem was it led to worse outcomes. And you can see this is consistent between previous research. You'll see now British Journal. Now, when I published uh, Anatomy of an Epidemic in 2010, it was considered heresy to suggest that scientific literature showed or at least raise the question that these drugs were impairing long-term outcomes on the whole. Now it's, it's really coming to the fore and you're hearing more people in respective places saying maybe this is so. And this is your editor, British Journal of Psychiatry. This is not a wild cry from the distant outback, but a considered opinion by influential researchers. Increasing body of evidence that the adverse effects are, are to put it simply, not worth the candle. Even our recently resigned director is now saying what does it say about the long-term use of antipsychotics? Are they potentially harmful? Again, I will tell you, when Anatomy of an Epidemic was published, I was likened in one major newspaper to an AIDS denier, which is like saying to the public, this guy is anti-scientific. Now you have the head of uh, NIMH saying this. If we had time, we could also sh go and talk about a program in northern Finland where they use the drugs very selectively, limited for psychotic patients. That's the open dialogue uh, program you've heard so much about. They now have the best outcomes in the Western world, so we even have an example of how to do it differently. But here's what I want to show you. We have, if we look at this counter-narrative, I've really presented a counter-narrative here today, but it's not that there's dueling evidence. I admit, I say there's this evidence with relapse studies. That's one body of evidence, and now I'm saying there's this other body of evidence. And on this counter-narrative where you're really looking, you see that a worry arises in science. It's good science that explains the increased chronicity. It has a biological explanation. You see that arise from the 1980s in mainstream psychiatric research done by the NIMH. You see the worry arise. And now if we go over the 30 years and we look at all the different types of research we can find, what do we find? Cross-cultural studies, negative for antipsychotics. Animal modeling studies, negative for antipsychotics. MRI findings, negative. Longitudinal study, negative, that's Harrow. Randomized study, wondering, that's negative. Drug compliance study, that's the last one, negative. Now all I'm saying to you here, at some point it becomes a, so a social responsibility and a question, and this, I think this is why you're here, to sort of look at this evidence and then you all can decide and have a discussion, how meaningful is this evidence? Is it convincing to you or not? It may not be convincing to you. I've given grand rounds, and my favorite response in a debate was this. A group of psychiatrists. I presented basically this data. And finally, uh, this was the response from the, like, one of the head psychiatrists. He says, I'm so sick of evidence-based medicine. <laughs> he did. And what he says is, I know these drugs work. I see them work every day. I don't want to hear this anymore. And you know what? That was actually an honest response. Uh, in a sense, is that's what his world is. So anyway, what I, what I hope you see in this last, I've gone over five minutes here, is at the very least, there's a body of information out there that needs to be known, both in the psychiatric community and larger, and we need to discuss this. And I think ultimately what it will lead to is, can we figure out a use for these drugs, much more limited, uh, like they have done in open dialogue, that produces so much better results. And this is actually a, an optimistic story. You remember that healing you saw between year two and four and a half? What you're really seeing here is a natural resilience, a natural capacity to recover. And imagine if we supported that. Those people who got off meds left care. They weren't getting any care at all. And you know what happened, Harold found? They disappeared into society, those who got off successfully. Some, one became a doctor, uh, not a doctor, there was a, prof a lawyer, a teacher. Do you think now then in their job they go, hey, you know, I used to be schizophrenic? <laughs> they disappear. And what we're really seeing here in this is uh, a possibility of having much greater long uh, improved outcomes. So thank you.